Hi, everybody, and uh, welcome once again to the third day of developer sessions at EGX 2014. I'm Ollie Welsh from Eurogamer. Uh, thank you very much for coming. If you're watching the stream on Twitch, hello. If you have questions for the developer uh, and you're watching on Twitch, do post them in the chat. And uh, if we have time at the end and if my Wi-Fi holds up, I should be able to get a couple of those asked. Um, we've got Evolve coming up in one hour's time and in two hours' time, The Witcher 3. But for now, showing you his next game, Volume, the designer of Thomas Was Alone, Mike Bethel. Oh, stop. Hello. Am I... Am I... Yes, I'm good. I don't know why I'm testing that. They spent like 20 minutes checking. Although I have been informed that this thing could come off at any point. Uh, if it does happen, please see it as a humanizing and cool moment, which we can share together um, and not, you know, in, laugh at me, basically. Please don't laugh at me. Do anything but laugh. Okay, um, so this is volume. Um, so uh, it's my new game. Um, I'm, showing, I'm showing it down, uh, well, yeah, downstairs from here uh, in the rest area. It's going pretty well, people seem to like it, but what we wanted to do right now was kind of show a few elements of that demo, uh, because obviously there are people on, on Twitch who, who aren't here, um, and also I'm pretty good at the game and I want to show off. Um, <laughs> I've been practicing for years, um, in my mind. Um, and then uh, also I want to show you uh, some, of the, some of the new stuff, some of the stuff that is, we call it alpha, it means buggy, it's very buggy, um, and therefore can't be in the build we've got on the show floor, but it's hopefully going to hold up, and I can show you that uh, on stage. So you get a little bit of extra stuff. Also, um, I like to do a bit of Q&A at, uh, at this kind of event because people want to ask cues and I like to A. Um, that doesn't, doesn't work, I'm going to change that. That sounded cooler in my head than it did out loud. Um, I'm going to stop rambling. Uh, this is volume. Uh, so I'm going to kind of shut up a bit. Can I just, actually, let's do a show of hands. Who in the audience has played the demo on the show floor already? Okay, that affects how I'm gonna do this because I'm not gonna show you too much of the stuff you've already seen. I'm gonna show you just a little bit, just a, just a taste, uh, just to show some of the people watching uh, on Twitch uh, some of the VO that we've got in, which I'm really happy with. Uh, I locked two amazing actors in a room together and wouldn't let them out until they'd recorded. It seems a shame to waste that. Okay, let's go into uh, office files. You're picking this up fast. You've got previous experience, right? You've been a Gisborne employee for a while. You could say that. Well, the next environment focuses on beginner gunplay, but it looks like you might be beyond that. I'm experiencing temporary errors in my employee database. Standard guard training, right? Walking back and forth. Keeping an eye on the family jewels. Yep. What else have you got? Particularly proud of that joke. Oh, infiltration. Knew it. Probably black ops, bomb type stuff. Maybe that's why you're not in the database. Stealth. Pretty cool. Okay. You can do this. I'm applying a bit of simple AI to each guard. Enough for you to go up against. No. Simulated stealth. Perfect. That's not perfect, but it should definitely have isn't. the skills you'll need for what comes next. So what I'm doing here is I'm using a gadget called the Folly, um, which I can use to essentially as a trip lot wire. Um, I can place it between two tall walls, and any enemy that moves through that will be kind of instantly knocked out, but only for a few seconds, which is just, just enough time to do one thing, usually. Um, in this case, to get this gem that he's, he's, he's watching and guarding quite intently. Uh, he's, he likes that gem. Uh, let's, uh, let's get him out of the way, though. That will stun him, and then hopefully, I can get out through there. I'm just going to work my way back to the exit and leave. Uh, here I'm using environmental interactions, uh, the trap doors. Uh, we have quite a few of these uh, in the game. Um, a lot of them don't have animations yet because I don't reply to my animator who's in the front row's uh, emails very often. Um, I'm a bad, bad person to work with. Um, but I'm kind of charming, so people tend to forgive me, which is unfair, really. I take advantage. Um, thank you, Aaron. Um, let's uh, just get through this, this section here. I can't kill anyone, uh, which makes the game... Oh, damn. Let's get to the exit before he comes to uh, investigate. 
and I got away. So uh, you can't kill anyone in the game. You have to use the environment uh, to get around and be clever, basically. That's your weapon in this game, is to take in your surroundings, be aware of what's going on, and then steal stuff uh, without getting caught. Um, what you heard there was uh, some of the voiceover in the game. Um, the game takes place entirely in this one room, this kind of, uh, it's a training environment for bad guys, basically that uh, the player breaks into, Loxley, played by uh, Charlie McDonnell, who's big on YouTube, my, my little sisters tell me. Um, <laughs> and, um, and you break in and you, you start playing and using this in order to show the population of England how to rob from the rich. Um, it's a, an update of Robin Hood, basically, and it's, a, it's been a lot of fun putting together. Uh, we have some really cool stuff going on in the story. We had Danny Wallace back from Thomas Was Alone, uh, who is, Basically my lucky charm at this point. Um, <laughs> putting him in games just gives me hope that someone might play them. Um, <laughs> because people liked him. Uh, so I assume as long as Danny is in every game, I will continue to be allowed to come up here, basically, on this stage and talk to you all, uh, hopefully. Um, we also, we've just cast uh, the bad guy in the game, uh, Gisborne, the evil fiendish uh, character that you're... Uh, you're up against. Uh, we're very excited because he's kind of awesome. Um, and I'm, I, oh, I want to say the name, but I can't. But I will. Uh, we're going to do. We're going to be talking about that hopefully, kind of towards the end of October, which should be very exciting. So what I want to show you now um, is some more gameplay uh, because gameplay is important. Um, unless you've got Danny Wallace, like that's basically the way to avoid having to put gameplay into your game. We have Danny Wallace, but we're not going to rest on our laurels. Uh, we're going we're gonna to try and put in some more gameplay mechanics. And this is the stuff that's kind of a little ropey, so if there's a bug, I apologize. Um, not heavily, uh, but yes. So this is a kind of a demonstration level that we've put together. You probably won't be able to play this level in the game. It's more just to show you guys some of the stuff we've been working on. We've talked a lot about the sound in the game and the way sound works, uh, that you can use sound to distract enemies, that you can um, actively kind of play with that and use that to manipulate enemies' behaviors. What we haven't talked about up till now is the visual stuff. It's been really fun putting this in because it's very important to us that we don't create an ambiguous game. This is a game about being clever. It's a game about knowing your environment and making the right choices very quickly. Uh, therefore, anything that's kind of too complex or too messy or too analog, anything where you're not quite sure if anyone can see you, breaks the game and ruins that sense of kind of empowered intelligence, which is what we're going for. I keep saying that. Um, it'll probably be on the box, um, if there is a box. Uh, there probably isn't a box. So the first thing uh, here is, this is how we deal with shadow. Uh, so, so these kind of uh, cross-hatched areas here, uh, if you move into them, uh, you go into shadow mode. And it's a binary thing, you're either in shadow or you're not. And if you are in shadow, I'm gonna do this on this screen because there's no delay on this screen, I can actually see what's going on. Um, you're invisible to enemies, uh, which is quite cool. So you can use shadows, you know, it, when they're placed in the environment, you can use shadows to have fun, basically. This game is essentially a game about trolling guards um, and kind of actively messing with them. Uh, so let's go into this little patch of shadow here. And like everything in volume, um, the levels are made in the in-game editor. Uh, I don't have a secret cool editor I use. If you see it in any of these demos, you could make it using the in-game editor. Um, so you have access to all the mechanics, basically. And you have them from the moment you buy the game. You have to unlock them through play because why? You've given me your money. I am going to let you put a shadow on the floor. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> so let's have some fun here. So let's get through this space. This is an impossible space uh, if we couldn't hide in shadows, which we're going to do. And he's going to see me, but that's fine, because shadow. Where did he go? I love, I love making stealth AI, because the fun thing about stealth AI is there is a a middle ground between you don't want them to be, obviously in real situations, they'd be like, what the hell just happened? We lost sight of him. But in stealth games, they have to think it might have been the wind. Um, <laughs> I had so much fun recording that line of dialogue for the game. They do occasionally say, must have been the wind. Um, they also call you a taffer. Um, let's grab the gems. Uh, there's one here and one here. And let's do this in a reasonably stealthy way. There we go. So I've got the gems in this rare area, using the shadows, and now I can just quickly nip into here, let these guys walk back, and I'm out of that area. 
So that's cool, that's cool. I, th I think it's cool, I hope it's cool. If it's not cool, don't tell me, you'll upset me. Um, <laughs> but we have a few other things as well. So the first one is the masquerade. Now this is, this is something you don't get straight away in the game. This is about halfway through the game you get this one, I believe. Um, let's pick it up. Now all the gadgets we've shown have been kind of projectile-y, things you throw into the environment and maybe bounce off walls or just place in place. This is one of our abilities that actually is applied to the player character. And what it is, is it's, an, it's a bad guy disguise. So I'll just put it on. And they're going to look at you because you look really weird. Um, but they're, not gonna, they're, gonna, they're just going to watch you as you pass by, kind of wondering what the hell's going on. And every now and again, they'll ask you if you're the new guy, uh, which is quite fun. So I'm going to use that ability, and I'm going to go through this teleporter here. Just by chung, chuck it on. He needs to see my ID. He won't have time, because uh, I'm going over here. Now, obviously, if they look at you for long enough, um, they're going to work out. They're going to see through your disguise. Also, if there's multiple of them, they're going to see through the disguise faster. So you have to be quite careful with when you use that and how many enemies are around you. It's a, it's a very tactically difficult thing. However, and that's cool, don't get me wrong, that's awesome, but really you want invisibility. Um, so very much later in the game, towards the end, it's something we put in kind of for fun, um, you get the veil. And the veil is proper, basically it's shadow wherever you want it. Um, you get it for a very limited time, so you, you switch it on, you, you move around, and no one can see you. So let's just, we're going to teleport back, but if you remember, that guy's staring directly at that teleporter. So if I were just to teleport over, actually let's see what would happen if I didn't use invisibility. Not goodness, badness, and a reset. So let's actually, let's use the invisibility. I'm going to have to grab the masquerade again. Oh, it's disguise. Oh, you knew. <laughs> awesome. I should stop laughing at my own jokes. Right, let's grab the, uh, the invisibility there. Let that charge. And then we're going to go invisible, and we're going to teleport through. And he's not going to see us. He's not even going to wonder why the teleporter just lit up, because I've not coded that in yet. Um, <laughs> he should probably be like, go, why is the teleporter on? I don't know. I'll put that in. Let's, and then let's quickly dash to the exit. Um, now, the great thing is you can go invisible mid-shooting, and they get very confused. And if I can just get past these two guards before that runs out, I can get to the exit. That thing? That was such a good thing. <laughs> That's the cool thing about what we do. I, I love that that just happened because it's a really rare occurrence. Um, so that's, what we, that's where the, the character stuff and where getting the cool voiceover actors in the booth helps us because they have chatter as they're going. These are two people, well, it's a, they're, they're a person and an AI who are working, basically. They're, and they're, it's like they're in the office. So they chat and they discuss things as they're going around. And obviously, as the stakes increase, they make less jokes about each other's performance. But yeah, that was Alan, the game's AI, saying you did a good thing, basically. He was proud of me in that moment. And that means a lot to me. Um, <laughs> so, so because I was, so I was planning to do more of the stuff from the stand, but as most of you seem to have played the version on the stand, which is awesome, by the way. Thank you so much for taking your time and, and queuing and doing that. That's really cool of you. Um, I'm not going to show any more for now. What I'm going to do is I'm going to open up to questions and do a kind of a Q&A thing. Um, if, if, if people don't have questions, I'll demonstrate some more levels, but I think what's cooler is if you guys kind of tell me what you want to know about and I can talk for a bit. Makes sense. Cool, and also hopefully Twitch has some questions as well. Hopefully. Uh, Fingers thanks, crossed. Uh, we're going to bring uh, Mike down into this aisle here. If you have a question, just come and queue up behind the mic and uh, make sure you speak nice and close into the mic. So uh, just get up and queue, basically, if you... Uh, okay, there's a few people. That's good. That's good. Hi, Mike. <laughs> so it, it, sorry, just sorry, one moment. Just basically, if you want to get up and get in the queue so you're there to go when we, when we get to you, feel free. Just jump up and stand up, unless your legs are tired from walking around some kind of games event for days on end. <laughs> um, cool. Sorry, sir. Please, let's go. 
Hi, Mike. Uh, Hi. I like that in that new mechanic, it's kind of like a bit social stealth, hit many. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, that looks interesting. Uh, you mentioned Taffer. Are there going to be more thief references? I mean, the whole game's a thief reference, <laughs> in fairness. No, um, a few. Like, there's a few jokes in there. It's, um, it's, it's interesting. In terms of, like, the design of the game and the look and the story, the idea is really was to take Robin Hood kind of this medieval legend, which Thief owes a lot to, actually, as well. There's a lot of shared kind of history there. Um, and mix it with all the cool cyberpunk stuff that I'm into as well, and kind of see if something interesting comes out the other end of that. Um, so in terms of direct Thief references, there's a few Taffer lines, there's a few... There has to be rats. Say again? There has to be rats. There's, there's some references to them, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and also, like, some, some of the level names are kind of puns, because... I'm English, and I think that's funny. Um, <laughs> but yes, um, so there's, there's a few little thief references in there, um, but not so much that it overtakes it, because there's also the thing of kind of, it, this is my stealth game, and this is my love of the stealth genre, which means Metal Gear, obviously, Thief, bit of Deus Ex, Hitman, Splinter Cell, all these games that I love. There's a few references in there to all of them, but I don't want to overwhelm the game. I don't want it to be like, a, like those awful kind of um, scary movie kind of things where it's just, oh, it's a reference to that, oh, it's a reference to that. You know, I kind of don't want to overwhelm it. So, uh, yeah. I have just one last question. Sure. Um, in a recent Edge uh, article about indie labels, you and a bunch of developers were talking about, mm -hmm. and then you started talking about um, violence and how our industry like two outsiders shows a lot of uh, violence. Mm -hmm. So, and then um, I think one from Media Marco, one, one person mentioned how press X to kill is like the most satisfying mechanic we found in the industry. Mm -hmm. So, and then you mentioned that it kind of ruins that you can't kill in your game. But I've noticed that more games have been trying to help you in, like accommodate that kind of ghosting playthrough mm -hmm. where you're like just sneaking past people and like yeah. I just noticed one game here Marvelous Mistake it's which is game. yeah really very good. much yeah. like that like you just pick up uh, steal some paintings <laughs> and then you run away and then uh, how come that like that thing came about like you didn't want violence in the cool. game um yeah so first of all Marvelous Mistake is awesome and it's coming out before this game which is annoying um but we both we actually we did like a little game dev exchange program earlier where I went and played that and they came and played volume and, and kind of stole each other's ideas essentially. Um, <laughs> so which is good, which is what you can do when you're an indie. We're not in direct competition, which is awesome. We can both kind of do cool things. To answer your question specifically about violence, I think there's a lot of conversation about this obviously at the moment and has been for a long time. Um, my view on it is violence is fun. Like I really enjoy killing stuff in video games. And, and uh, we can discuss that at a later day. But I think, um, I think we do need to be careful that we don't just express that to the outside world, that your average person's view of video games is not that they're about guns. Because video games are about guns, but they're also about mushrooms and weird things and awesome stuff as well. Um, and guns are awesome, but they're one part of a big thing. So I think we just need to balance that realistically when we talk about games kind of outside of our super nerdy bubble. In terms of this game, um, it was really, it wasn't even an ethical choice. It wasn't, I don't want violence in my game. It was specifically with stealth. Um, stealth has been kind of broadened, and we've seen this in a lot of the genres, uh, to kind of try and get a larger audience. And the way they've done that is largely by allowing for, um, for killing, for action gameplay, for um, making stealth a choice. Um, and they often, a lot of them, do a really good job of providing a stealth option. I love Dishonored stealth mechanics, until I realized how awesome the game was with the sword. Um, and I loved, um, I loved Splinter Cell stealth mechanics, until you get the tagging guns. I think, I think these games are awesome. Um, I still buy and play all of them. But I think what they do by having that focus on action is actually, it means that there's all these weird stealth mechanics that I never play. I'd never, I've never shot a noisemaker in a Splinter Cell game, ever. I've never, I always finish every first person shooter with a bag full of grenades just in case I need them for the final boss fight. Um, I, I, I feel that there's all these mechanics that are in there that I don't use because silence pistols are really effective and I can always just walk up behind someone and use the instant stealth kill button. Um, so it wasn't, it's not that those games are bad, it's just that I kind of wanted to make the game about the weird stealth stuff, the weird kind of the avoidance stuff, the messing with people, the kind of uh, using distractions. 
And by just removing that easier kind of path for the player, I kind of make a game that's all about those things. And there's lots of choices there. The fact that you don't have like a limited number of invisibilities, you just have a recharge time. So everything in the game pushes you to use the cool weird stuff. You know, you're not saving the invisibility in case you need it. You just use it because the faster you use it, the faster it's going to recharge for the next time you want to use it. Um, so that's the answer, really. It's, 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 it's not a value judgment. It's just the game I wanted to make was about the weird esoteric stuff. And that meant pulling away from some of the, the other kinds of gameplay. Awesome. Go ahead. Hi, Mike. Uh, Hello. With, um, this is really a follow-up to Thomas is Alone, but mm -hmm. the hype that was generated around Thomas was Alone, I know Nurkib recently said on his Twitter that uh, he was getting a little bit worried about volume. Sorry, who, you, who, said, who said that on? Nerd Cubed. Oh, okay. uh, yeah, he said he was getting a bit worried that it might not live up to Thomas Was Alone. <laughs> I mean, what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think Dan needs to stop making those kind of comments on Twitter. That's my main <laughs> thought. <laughs> I hope he's watching. Dan, stop it. Um, no, I think it's fair. I think hype is a very interesting thing. Like, I, I know I get hyped about games, and I'm not going to knock other people's games, but very recently I got hyped about one particular game, and, and the game didn't kind of live up to the impossible version I designed in my head. Um, which was never going to actually exist. I think hype's dangerous because hype can, hype basically can very easily turn into disappointment. Um, so I'm very careful when I talk about my games. Um, the way I try and do it is I play things down. I try and present things as I did just then. I don't talk about awesome things that might happen. I literally show you this is the thing you can do in the game. And if you think that's kind of funny and cool, then great. If not, fair enough. Um, I want you to make your decision about whether this game is cool when you read a review or you play it, I don't want you to make that decision nine months ahead of time based on an awesome trailer. Although I will try to make the trailers reasonably good. Uh, we try. <laughs> um, so I, I worry about hype as well. I don't want my players to play volume and be disappointed. I want them to love it. Um, so I, I try and keep things kind of mellow. In Dan's case, unfortunately, um, he loves Thomas Was Alone, and he's a big stealth fan. So I think he's... I, I need to, like... I need to send him a really buggy build, basically, and just kind of lower his expectations, like make them nosedive, so that when he finally plays the final version, he'll think it's amazing. But it's a very good point, and it's something that we need to be careful not to ruin our games before we give them a chance to be cool. I'm going to jump in with a quick question from Twitch. Uh, Guy cool. says, any lessons learned from Thomas Was Alone that you've applied here in volume? Oh, um, yeah, loads, actually. I, like, I think on some level, volume is, is the answer to every problem that happened in Thomas Was Alone. Uh, Thomas Was Alone did well. Um, obviously, it kind, of, it kind of, it was awesome. It kind of, well, the game wasn't awesome, but the reaction to the game was awesome. I think the game's okay. Um, and it did all right, and it, it, but there were lots of things I felt could have done, been done better. One of the big ones was the lack of level editor. It's the most commonly requested feature is, how do I make a level? I want to make a level for Thomas Was Alone. The reality of Thomas Was Alone is it's so badly made. Um, and I'm not, this isn't like, I, I self-deprecate a lot, uh, especially in front of crowds of people. Um, but genuinely, it was awful. Um, it was really terrible. Um, and if you'd moved a wall slightly to the left, it would break the entire game. Um, so I couldn't really go back and add a level editor. Um, so that was something I really wanted to do for volume, was allow players to be creative with my game. And really, volume's entire structure allows for that creativity. I love the fact that hopefully if we can get it working. Uh, the story isn't tied to the levels. So the story plays out based on essentially how many levels you've completed or how long you've been playing the game. Um, the actual kind of the, uh, the content you're playing through, the kind of the levels that load up, I'm going to ship the game obviously with quite a few of them. Um, but if you want to, you can actually play through the story campaign of volume without touching those levels. You can just engage with the content that other people have made online. So in theory, six months after release, it will be entirely possible that people have never played my levels, though they've just bought the game and just played the online stuff. And that's kind of exciting to me. I like that when games kind of have a life after the, the stuff that I made. I like that. Um, so that's the biggest one. That's the, the really enormous one. But then lots of little ways. It's got rectangles in it. <laughs> Hi, Mark. You've kind of touched us on this a little bit. Um, sure. But uh, Thomas Was Alone is now known for being a very emotive, very narrative-driven game. And you've said in the past, some of that was intentional, but some of that was being injected by the player in regards mm. to like obesity or you know, yeah. uh, the easiness of certain characters. Mm -hmm. uh, that was all created in the, characters, in the player's mind's eye. How explicit is the narrative in volume? Is this another emotional journey we're mm. being taken on, or is it one where the, the seeds of the story are planted for the, the player to inject their own 
you know, own fears, anxieties, or you know, their own narrative around the clues you've given? That's, a, that's an awesome question. Um, so, so obviously, because of the, the, the graphical difference, you know, this one has graphics. Because um, <laughs> of that jump, um, there is a, it was more difficult to do what we did with Thomas Was Alone. Thomas Was Alone was very archetypal and very much kind of not tied to specific... Kind of, you, there was lots of room for the imagination, whereas when you present things in this way, things are more locked in. To answer your question, the, the, I try something different in this one. This game is a game, really, this is a game about a relationship. It's about the, uh, the AI Alan and um, Rob Loxley, who's this kid who's broken into the volume. And it's about their relationship and how that changes over the course of basically the three hours before Loxley gets captured by the evil bad guy. That's revealed in the first few seconds of the game. It's, I'm not spoiling anything. But basically you're seeing a, the three hours of a relationship. Um, and in that, it's kind of explicit in that you're hearing the conversations they're having and you're, you're seeing that growth happen. Um, but what, what I've tried to do in terms of the uh, leaving room for imagination is everything that's happening outside of this room. The entire game takes place in this room, but the events that happen within that room influence the entire world of this game. And you start to, I try not to spoil anything, you start to see those impacts happening, or it's implied that that's happening. You're, you're starting to find out that things are happening outside of that one room, um, and that's not explicit. That is little st stolen pieces of, pieces of text that pop up in level descriptions or items you pick up or things you start to uncover something bigger than what's going on in the game. And that's kind of, for me, that's where the, the kind of the mystery element of the game is. We'll see if I pull it off. And just, just a, a quick silly question to nullify the, the intelligence of my previous question. Oh, don't ruin it. Everyone in this room thinks you're really clever. And oh, you're that's going to blow us apart. <laughs> Go on. You have a, a big actor for the antagonist. What fruit would he be? Which, which fruit? Which fruit would he be? <laughs> the, the, the problem is that this clip will be used when I announce the game, <laughs> the, the actor, and he will, I guess as he's an actor, no, no that's a bad joke. Um, I, I, on it, I'm going to say banana, and it's nonsensical, it means nothing, because that will make, that will make life a lot easier for me. Banana, he's a banana. Thank you so much. I'll Thank now you. eat bananas from now on. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. Next question. Hi, Mike. Hello. Uh, firstly, love the game. My only complaint is that there's not more levels out on the shore floor to play. I apologise. <laughs> did you manage to complete everything that was there? Yeah. And how long did it take you? Um, about five, ten minutes. That's it was, the reason. Yeah. <laughs> I, I wanted the guy stood behind you to have a go as well. <laughs> yeah. No, I appreciate that. It's, yeah, it's, I'm looking forward to you being able to play more levels. Yeah. So my question is kind of not related to volume, but more about your development. Sure. Uh, at E3 later, earlier this year, uh, a lot of the big studios started uh, showing more concepts for games that are currently in development, mm -hmm. and it didn't go down very well. But one of the things I've liked about following your tweets, for example, you put a lot of like little snippet clips too and much. screenshots too much people of the say. game. Yeah. But um, I think that's like a really interesting way to see how a game is evolving. Do you think that's something that's only going to really work for the indie scene, or can you see AAAs doing it as well? It's a really good question as well. I think the thing that that one, I think in order for you to want to read all that stuff, you have to be the kind of player who's interested, right? You have to be someone who seeks out that information. And, and I think the Twitter's a good place to do that, to follow game developers and kind of see their screenshot Saturdays, or in my case, see their vines of funny bugs or weirdness that's going on in the game. Um, I think for me, I think AAA, that can absolutely work for. Um, the challenge in doing so is to find the right way to present that to people. Um, and to present that in a way that if your audience is just casually kind of waiting to see the game come out, you show those people a cool trailer and then you, you, know, you shut up for a bit and let them come, and come to the game later. But for hardcore fans like yourself who want to know how things are actually progressing, you provide lots of content. It's about staggering stuff. There's a reason that like when I showed volume at Gamescom, it was just a cool trailer because that audience don't want to hear what I had for breakfast. Maybe they do. Um, but <laughs> I, don't, I don't think they do. So that was, so it's about finding the right place to, to speak to different people. Um, and I think if AAA do it somewhere like Twitter that makes sense, I think it would be very successful. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, another quick Twitch question. Sure. Uh, Dead Pixel Gaming says, I love the graphic style. How did you come about it? 
how did I come about it? Uh, so those Metal Gear Solid VR missions exist. No, I'm joking. <laughs> uh, weirdly, like I, I, like I get like a lot of people say, oh, you've, you've, you're inspired by Metal Gear Solid VR missions, and it's, it's weird how it took us like a lot of the concept artists in the audience as well. It took us a lot of time to to get to that look. <laughs> like we didn't set out to do it. It kind of just kind of happened. Um, so, so really, the, the thing about the art style is, is it, was, it was born out of necessity. Um, with independent game creation, um, we are limited, right? We don't have the money to make a game where you travel across exotic locations for 10 hours. Um, we have to make choices that support our game and give you a cool visual experience, but that don't cost us too much money. Um, so the idea to kind of set it in one room and have these kind of low poly environments that you run around was a way of solving that problem. It meant that our artists could focus on making one room look really good and then make all of those kind of geometric simple forms look cool. Um, and then I could do all the kind of shader shenanigans that make things glow and look kind of badass and the glitch effect that happens every now and again that the video guys were worried about for about 10 minutes because they thought that that was that was them. It wasn't. Sorry, guys. Um, <laughs> that was me. That's a, that's a fake. That's how pretentious I am. I create fake errors in my games. Um, so, it, so it's really about just kind of having a limitation and then working out the best way out of that limitation. It's, I always use the example of Kevin Smith making uh, Clerks. Uh, he worked in a shop, and he, all he had to do was add one scene at the start of the movie where it explains why the shutters are down. Uh, and it meant he could film his movie at night in a fully stocked shop, which would cost a lot of money to create a set of. So it's about what, finding out what you have and then working out how to make the best thing out of it. Next question. Yeah. Um, hey. For, yeah. Um, for me, the, one of the most interesting things about Volume 8 Eurogamer this year has not been the game itself, but like some of the people I've been talking to about it, mm -hmm. um, particularly a lot of female players. Um, Generally, a lot of the people I've spoken to have been female players who generally don't like stealth games, mm -hmm. but have really enjoyed their time with volume, just oh, in cool. terms of finding an accessible game and enjoying sort of the presentation. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask sort of what your thoughts on that were, and if you had any idea why this game in particular has been more accessible to audiences that sometimes don't like stealth games. I, like, that's really cool. Um, <laughs> basically, like, that's my, my first response is that's really cool. Um, I didn't really set out, I didn't set out to make it inaccessible. I definitely didn't try to do that, but I didn't really set out to make it um, to broaden the audience for stealth games. If anything, I think actually it's probably like the most focused way I could make a stealth game for stealth game fans. Um, I don't know. I, I, you know, I bet a lot of that is the Thomas Was Alone overlap. I bet that's a lot of people who, who play Thomas Was Alone and, you know, Thomas Was Alone is a very accessible game. Um, hopefully kind of good depictions of both genders and, and it's generally kind of played I know a lot by women players as well as, as male players and I, I, I guess that's maybe that's made them give it a go like that's that's the that's the cool thing is 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 perhaps that's made them overlook kind of their their discomfort with the genre, genre normally and try it other than that I don't know it's cool though um, it's really cool it's always cool when when anyone who, who's not like a hardcore game, game, game kind of person, or isn't into the genre you're making the game in, uh, as you say, um, actually likes it. Because that's kind of almost more of an achievement than, because I know people like me are gonna like this game, because I like this game, well, on the good days. Um, not, not every day, so a lot of days I hate the game. Um, shouldn't say that, it's bad marketing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's very cool, and I, kind of don't understand it, but I, I like it. I'm happy about it. <laughs> yeah, one more. Um, well, I had one question, and then someone else had the exact same question a few minutes before me, so I've had to come up with a new one. Have you, which is though? a bit worse, but there you go. Oh, okay, that's um, cool. We'll work with it. We'll work regarding with it. the items and the pickups and such, is it on a level-by-level -level basis, or is, once you've got that item, do you keep it for the rest of the game? That's a, good, that's a good question as well. Um, it's on a level-by-level level basis, that's the thing. Um, it was, that was a really tricky one, because once we made the decision that, um, that, that basically that people could create their own levels and do whatever they wanted, we had to work out um, how to make that work, because if we have an inventory that you're building up, um, we, the people making the level don't know if you've got the invisibility powers. They can't make a level that requires that or uses that in a cool way, because they don't know if you've got it yet. 
Um, there are ways around that. You can kind of have people set their own requirements, but that's very hard to get your head around. Uh, we'd have lots of errors. We'd have lots of versions of the game that didn't quite work for people, and I wanted to keep things simpler. So everything is picked up in the level. Um, everything is specific to the level, and that actually makes puzzle design in the game more straightforward because we, we know exactly what you have, and we know the order you're going to have things. We can make a, a bit of the game that's really hard to get through without a gadget and then give you that gadget and then you go back and, and suddenly own that level. Um, so it, it kind of frees us up to do slightly more creative stuff. Um, so that's the answer to the question, really. And it also plays into this idea of experimentation. I don't want you, I don't want you to not use an ability because you're bored of it. Um, I want to keep giving you reasons to find it interesting, and that means building levels that really use it in a cool way. So fingers crossed that works. Okay, that's all we've got time for, but before I let you go, lots yeah. of people on Twitch, including Harry1995, have been asking any release date. A release date. Um, for now, so I said 2014, but that's not going to happen. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry. Um, never saying a uh, date that early again. I was optimistic. I had dreams. It was lovely. Um, <laughs> I was young then, <laughs> a year ago. Um, 2015, we're saying, and we're saying specifically the first half of 2015. We're not saying anything more specific, um, but it will come to PlayStation 4 and Vita first, and then a month later, uh, PC and Mac, and then we'll see if anyone buys it. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, if you're watching on Twitch, stick around for Evolve at the top of the hour. And thank you to Mike Bethel. Thanks. So I'm here with...